Okay, well, the subject is uh, Vietnam-era Signal Corps. And uh, just as an aside in the beginning, I got to tell you, the Signal Corps uh, in the in that time frame, which was, I would say, you know, late 60s, early 70s, was in the perfect shitstorm. Uh, about anything that could go wrong went wrong. And uh, the leadership, I thought, was, was kind of lacking. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, we had at the same time going on the Vietnam War, the uh, signal leadership trying to move everybody to um, what was called the uh, user-owned and operated concept, where they dumped off a lot of uh, former Signal Corps missions, like radio teletypes, uh, comms, uh, not comm centers, but uh, uh, low-level switchboards, you know, a tactical unit switchboards, anything they could uh uh, we make it user-owned and operated, and therefore uh, we can wash our hands of that. And uh, it was really uh, screwed up a whole bunch of stuff. Um, uh, good examples of that kind of thing were uh, they decided that tactical radio was no longer a single core responsibility. And if you wanted to, uh, what they did was they set up schools in uh, in, in other branches. So um, like the artillery was tasked with giving the uh, FM tactical radio instruction for the whole army. And if you weren't in the artillery, uh, you, you had a kind of a problem. Uh, the infantry schools took over uh, also the same tactical radio stuff uh, using, uh, I'll get into the equipment later, but, you know, the VRC-12 family of uh, VHF FM stuff, which was just coming in the inventory uh, at that time. Uh, if you were an artillery guy, and you needed to learn radio stuff. They sent you to Fort uh, Sill. If you were an aviation guy, and they did a pretty good job uh, uh, at Sill uh, with uh, you know frequency engineering and, and antennas and stuff, but that was only the, for the artillery guys. The aviation guys did a pretty good job. If it was avionics you were working on, uh, and you had to go down to uh, Fort Rucker for about a, oh, I think it was like a nine or ten week course. And these were all basically AIT courses. And... Uh, if you were infantry, you ended up in places like Fort Dix. Uh, you had the combat support training brigades, and they had a radio and wire school, and I was the XO of the, the one in uh, Fort Dix for about three months before I went to Vietnam. And you really, these uh, branches were not real signal-oriented. Some of the instructors were signal, and some of them were not. They were combat arms guys, and that didn't help anything at all. Uh, then they did other things, like uh, they, they started to move – big pieces of the signal school from Fort Monmouth to Fort Gordon. And I don't think the Army ever recovered from that. The The level of instruction at Monmouth was way superior to anything they did at Gordon, and that went on for years, and I don't know if it's even been fixed now. Uh, and then, uh, to make things even worse, uh, we, we had a thing called, uh, in the early 60s, I guess, called the Reorganized Army Division, the ROAD concept where they redefined what the signal battalion was doing and uh, and and how it was supporting combat brigades and battalions. And, again, that was used as a vehicle to make things user-owned and operated. So we ended up with a, a signal center at brigade and another one at division, uh, one at division rear, one at the brigade rear, and those were all run by the signal battalion, uh, mostly consisting of a message center, a radio teletype set, and a uh, patch panel and, and microwave. Uh, microwave in those days was uh, like the Mark 69s. Uh, and, and then below that, you had a completely different set of people who reported using somewhat the same equipment, no microwave, but radio teletype and voice radio. They're reporting to the uh, combat commander of that brigade. And so there's a, a basic signal disconnect there. And uh, through all that kind of stuff, the, uh, the the wire guys were in there, half of which uh, belonged to the combat commander whose headquarters it was, and the other bunch uh, from the signal battalion who would drive up with a switchboard, sit it down and say, we're here, uh, run wires to us. And it was a very cumbersome way to, to do things. And making it even worse than that, they send a bunch of signal officers, a lot of them which were senior ones, on some kind of deal they had with, believe it or not, Harvard Business School. They send them up to Harvard, and the Harvard Business School says, you don't have to know much of this technology stuff. You manage systems and people. You're a manager. 
let the NCOs and the warrant officers worry about the technology. Okay. And so they bought into that. And that made things a lot worse because down at Gordon, when they structured the signal uh, officer's basic course, it was only like uh, nine weeks long. And how much technology do you think these guys are going to learn in nine weeks uh, before they get out to uh, to a, a unit that's actually in combat? And so that that was really crappy. And the, the theory there, and I heard it directly from the commandant, uh, who at that time was Colonel Ring, who they named the building after, down there at Gordon, uh, he says, uh, well, it's not all that bad because uh, once these lieutenants get to their battalions, the combat arms battalions that they're assigned to, they report into the commander to tell them that they're the S6, and uh, they'll learn everything they need to learn about communications from the uh, on-the-job training that they're going to get from the NCOs and the uh, warrant officers who were already there. And that was the theory. There was no follow-up, no correspondence courses, no tests, no uh, no follow-up really of any kind for these poor guys. They were given an MOS 0200, which is basic signal officer, and, and they're out there. Now, you got a combat commander, number one, he says, you're my S6, you're lieutenant, now you report to the S3 and go run the machine gun range or something. So they got no real training there. Uh, if you were on a three-year commitment, uh, you might go to a battalion in Germany. If you want a two-year commitment, you went to a battalion in CONUS, and then you went over to Vietnam. And that really, uh, really uh, made Signal Corps look bad, but... Uh, the signal leadership didn't really care because they were out there trying to run uh, uh, higher echelon stuff and trying to wash everything else into this user-owned and operated stuff. And that's kind of how we uh, prepared to deploy to Vietnam. And uh, it was not a good deal. The The OJT thing that they depended on after your nine weeks at Gordon uh, really never happened in most cases. And these guys were out there. They couldn't even turn on the, the PA system. And by the way, I saw more Signal Corps careers ruined by not coming up with a PA system that worked for a parade or something than, than almost anything else. Anyway, any, anybody got any questions on that? So that with that, we deployed to Vietnam. Uh, and that was uh, kind of sad. Uh, but the, the tie-in with the Harvard Business School, I've hated those graduates ever since. And let's see, I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, with that, we, we deployed to Vietnam. The divisions had the reorganized signal battalions, which basically called for one company from each um, signal battalion to support each combat brigade in a division. Uh, and what did these guys have? They had the comm center. They had radio teletype, which was big HF stuff uh, at the time. Um, and they had uh, patch panels and microwave uh, links back to the division system. Above division was, uh, uh, echelons above division and, and maybe even core was, uh, all this microwave stuff. And that turned out to be much too short range because Vietnam was long and narrow and they couldn't get everywhere with that. And that brought on the, uh, tropo scatter stuff, tactical tropo scatter, like the, uh, track nineties. And tropo scatter was pretty good. You could go almost 300 miles if you did it right. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with that, but uh, it basically called for a lot of high power. It was all fixed station, but that was okay because uh, most of the uh, connections were um, between uh, large base camps like uh, Saigon and Fulham and the Trang and Quinan and, and Da Nang and all those kinds of places. And so the tactical tropo, uh, which at that time used what was called um, – uh, oh, it was a digital mode. Um, I'll think of the name. But, and and you, you could get uh, 24, 12, or 48 channels of voice and on the voice road uh, teletype uh, between um, six stations like that. And that that, that was be really uh, above the division level. That was at the, uh, the core level. And a lot of uh, core area signal battalions were were uh, pushed over to Vietnam to, to, to do that kind of stuff. But that turned out also to be fairly in, inadequate. And 
we then uh, went into a big program called Back Porch, I think was one of the names for it. But what it basically boiled down to was every one of those big places that I just named, and there was probably a dozen of them, was going to get a LARC-3, LRC-3, I think it was, a uh, tropo scatter, fixed station, with a 120-foot high billboard antenna. And it looked like a billboard. Uh, you can go, I guess, online and see them. 120 feet high and probably uh, 100 feet wide, and into which we pumped uh, multiple kilowatts of power, and we were able to build a backbone uh, uh, between all the major fixed station base camps. And we were basically fighting a, a base camp war. The tactical units would spread out from their base camps and uh, patrol and get contact and then fight the war. But for, as far as the Signal Corps was concerned, we had this backbone and and we had to use that because uh the french didn't leave much there uh, we inherited a a system that was really uh, uh bare bones i mean they had a system there but it really uh, it was set up as a french colonial uh telephone system and and that worked as long as the vc didn't come along and cut the wires uh but we couldn't afford that so we had this big commitment to uh tropo at the strategic level and then uh, everything then had to interface back to the states and, you know, places so General uh, – the Pentagon could sit there and General Lewis Woolland later on could sit there and, and tell everybody what to do at the micromanagement level. So um, we had to rehab up the uh, Trans-Pacific Cable, which ran from uh, Fulham to the Philippines. And then from the Philippines, you could get on um, – uh, other trans-Pacific cables and get, end up with a telephone system that would go to, um, to the States and you could use that. And then, um, there was another terminal in Thailand and they tied into that. And that was basically the strategic communication stuff. The single court said, well, that's for echelons above core. And so we'll turn that over to the defense communications agency, DCA. And they basically were responsible for that. In country, uh, down at the tactical units, uh, the technology started to get really a lot better than it had been. We fielded the, uh, the VHF voice radio, the VRC-12 family of radios. And this was probably, and, and, and Harris guys that are making radios these days ought to look at it, probably the ideal radio for a combat arms guy. You had a on-off switch. It said low power, high power off. You had a uh, old squelch, new squelch, uh, switch and you had a frequency dial and that was it for the operator uh, but he did have to know how to hook up the uh, the antenna matching unit which was basically a, a base loaded 10 foot whip and uh, it was a fairly decent radio because it was so simple unfortunately had no comsec in the beginning and then later on uh, comsec was developed it was called nestor nestor worked uh, pretty good if you had a vehicle, but if you were a man pack, the man pack version of this system was a uh, thing called the PRC 25. The original ones they deployed didn't even have a ComSec connector. So that was replaced by the PRC 77, which did have a ComSec capability, but Nestor was a big box. So the original deployment, you had a guy with a, a big radio on his back. And if you were in the infantry, he not only had that, he had his all his personal stuff and his weapon. And he had the flares and the smoke grenades and the extra batteries. And this guy was pretty loaded up. So they put the ComSec on the back of a second guy and a cable, which is about maybe six feet long in between. And as soon as the first motor round went off, one guy went one way, the other guy went the other way. And that was the end of your secure communications, and that wasn't really fixed at all, except they they didn't use the Nestor on the man packs. Uh, that, uh, that wasn't fixed at all until we got Singars, which was a lot later. So that was a, a kind of a, a bad thing. Uh, but at the tactical level, another disaster was uh, they decided that in the combat arms battalion, the uh, the platoon leader, is the guy giving orders to the squads that are engaging the enemy. So if the squad leader had a radio clip to his helmet and they used the helmet, because remember they were steel pots in those days as the counterpoise. And if he had a little receiver there and if the Lieutenant had the same receiver on his helmet and the transmitter uh, that was putting out less than a watt, probably half a watt, 
he could direct his squad leaders to get up and rush those machine guns or whatever they were doing. And all of a sudden back at Fort Monmouth, and I saw this later on when I was rotated back, all these little antenna problems on that receiver. It was like a steel cable. You probably could have held up a bridge with it. But they're all coming back messed up, cut up, frayed, and all that kind of stuff. And what was the reason for that? They they, they wanted to have a big study, but it, I told them, it's real easy. The lieutenant said, get up and rush that machine gun. Never heard the order, lieutenant. The antenna's broken on this thing. It never heard you. And so that was a, a big problem. Uh, they never fixed that. They just took the radios out of service, basically. Uh, and they were supposed to be the infantry radio. did exactly what it was supposed to do. But uh, an order not not acknowledged is an order not sent, you know, and then and uh, they would just break the antennas. And that was kind of hard because they were like this real heavy steel stuff. But that's another story that uh, people don't really remember. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to say about that? The... Um, the PRC-25 was a, yeah, somebody just flashed one up there. There it is. And the box on the bottom there is is probably Nestor. And if you did that, uh, that was a load that was really hard to carry. And so they wouldn't carry it. Um, the vehicle radios, uh, they worked really well. Also, VHF FM, not, uh, not HF. And they were um, they were pretty decent. And they could be encrypted, but we didn't have the boxes. So a lot of that went uh, went unencrypted. Now, if you read my paper on uh, Project Touchdown, the bad guys were receiving the same stuff we, that we were talking about. There was really no ComSec. Uh, they didn't even change call signs and frequencies a lot in some of those infantry battalions. And the big offender there were field-grade officers. And they would let out all kinds of things, all kinds of homemade codes that didn't work and stuff like that, uh, unencrypted. So, again, when we built Singars, we made sure that was encrypted. Uh, and uh, that was uh, that was a thing that got a lot of people killed. If you uh, look at the action they had in the Edrang Valley, with uh, we were soldiers once and young, General Moore and that whole bunch there. These guys just got plopped in the middle of of a combat operation. Uh, they had man-packed PRC 25s in first cab division. They had no concept, uh, no cons- comm sec. And they weren't even smart enough to bring the, uh, ground mounted antennas, the RC 292s. And so they were out of range, uh, of their base, which was uh, play me or one of those places. And they couldn't talk direct. So had they do, do that, they had a helicopter circling around over the fight and a guy named Crandall, Major Crandall, is up there repeating by voice the messages he's getting from Colonel Moore on the ground about how bad things are and he could talk because he's up at 10,000 feet, he could talk to the bases and stuff. Uh, Not a good situation. As soon as the sun went down, uh, either they ran out of gas or they ran out of, uh, you know, we were all visual in those days and so That relay disappeared, and they were out there at night all by themselves. And the first thing I said when I saw that was, what happened to the PRC-74's HF sets? You could certainly, we were only talking about a distance of maybe 15 miles, but it was through the jungle. Any NVIS antenna, uh, even a low-power 20-watt set, which the PRC-74 was, uh, would make that. And there was a fire base in between. You could even relay through the fire base. They tried to set up a VRC-49 there that was a relay for the uh, VHF stuff, but uh, they never got that going either, uh, mostly because the, the user-owned uh, and operated guys didn't know how to operate. Anyway, so uh, that's a perfect example of how bad things got when when uh, when we deployed at that level, and that was mostly VHF. FF. The HF stuff... Uh, did a lot better. We had, um, in the middle of all this, a guy named George Hagen from SRI Institute was tasked to go out there and see if HF worked in the, in the jungle. Uh, they, they weren't too interested in, in stuff, uh, that was going on where, like long been and around there where things were flat. It was more like, uh, up in the highlands and in the mountains. They wanted to know if, uh, HF would work there. Now, of course, if you went back to World War II, of course it would work there if you had the right antenna and the right frequency. So Hagen's up there. 
uh, with inverted V's and, and, and a bunch of infantry guys to, to, uh, to, to protect him. And, uh, he's talking on his PRC 74 back to people, uh, anywhere within NVIS range. And that was great. And he wrote a great report and then nobody did anything about it. So, uh, HF at that, at that tactical level, the man pack stuff, the low power stuff, uh, almost never got used in the, uh, in the combat arms battalions. Uh, if they had vehicles, they did, they, nobody knew about tipping over whips or loops or anything like that. We didn't have a loop in the inventory, probably still don't, except for the helicopters. So, uh, that was a, a, a problem for, for, again, caused by the user owned and operated stuff and the refusal of the single core guys to get down to that level. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and do the job. Uh, I think that somebody just flashed up a picture of a PRC-74. And the, you can see the antenna there has got a uh, loading coil on it and all that stuff. And that was great for mobile. Uh, HF goes further over uh, over the ground than VHF does anyway. And they would have been a, a, a heck of a lot better uh, had they used those. At the same time, the soft guys are out there. They're using PRC 74s and uh, their base stations was the other workhorse of the HF world in those days, the GRC 106. And that was the base station radio put out about a hundred Watts. But again, uh, if that radio was in the radio teletype set run by the signal core guy from the signal battalion, uh, things worked pretty well, but uh, it had a very touchy antenna tuner. And if you didn't know what you were doing, uh, you could get the visor up so bad that it would burn up the final amplifier in the transmitter. And so the single core guys were aware of that, better trained, and it worked for for them. But the guys who were using the same radio, trained by the uh, branch schools or whoever, uh, were not real good at that. And I can't tell you the amount of uh, burned up transmitters that GRC 106s came out of uh, – Combat Arms Battalions and stuff, and 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 uh, the other big user of that radio was the uh, uh, mechanized uh, the armored cavalry regiments and guys like that because of the range. But they managed to burn up those radios because they didn't understand the system. Uh, and that was also going back to the beginning of my spiel here. That was also the thing. The, the Fort Gordon at the time decided that you didn't have to know systems if we're going to train you as a radio operator repairman. Uh, all you have to know is the box you're working on. So they had nothing, no system training. So if I'm working on the GRC 106 and I have a bad antenna matcher, well, that's somebody else's problem. I only work on the radio. And then if you had an antenna problem, that's somebody else's problem because we don't do antennas. We just work on this box. And the failure of them to teach the whole system uh, caused a lot of these problems. Uh the same with the VRC-12. Uh, a couple of times I get called out to uh, the 20th Engineer Brigade because the brigade commander says, my v- my VRC-12 don't work. And I was the closest guy, uh, signal guy there because I was uh, our headquarters was right next to theirs. So I go out there and I look at his Jeep and uh, the uh, matching unit's got some cracks in it. And I open up the bottom screw, which is like a drain, and about a couple water drains out of there. And the, the operator is looking at me, and he had no clue what to do there, <laughs> even to open the drain. And, and that's how uh, more problems came. And uh, then you'd find another one. He comes back later, and he says, it's still not working right. And I look at the antenna, and the top foot of the antenna is chopped off because he hit a tree somewhere. But nobody told him that that was a dipole underneath all of that, and you needed both ends of it. So they just cut off the end of the antenna, you know, stuff like that, because these guys were never trained on system, only on boxes. And later on, you could see that in, in MSE also, because uh, uh, the green light's on the packet switch, so everything here is okay. It's got to be someplace else. And that was uh, uh, another disaster that we had going. So couple all that uh, with the... Uh, with the, uh, the the stuff I talked about before, the OJT and, and all of that, and, and things in, in the lower echelons were not real good. Now, at the upper echelons, where you had the backbone and you had the real signal core um, echelons above core 
uh, uh, guys running the I, what was called the IWCS with those big uh, 120-foot fixed station tropo antennas and all that stuff. That was okay. That worked, and you could call from one end of Vietnam to the other as long as it was something connected to that backbone, uh, and uh, things were okay. Uh, except that uh, it was all manual and all the switchboard operators were Vietnamese nationals and they was pretty worried that some of them were listening in on some of those conversations, which they probably were. But uh, the, the radio part, at least, the single core part worked. The uh, They arrested a whole bunch of radio operators at, at one time, uh, not radio operators, telephone switchboard ladies. Uh, and they were all VC and they were listening in on a lot of stuff. But uh, that's another reason why the encryption stuff was was kind of important. But um, let's see. I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, between the uh, the tactical units not having the right training and the uh, signal corps leadership trying to say everything's user-owned and operated and all the officers are managers and not technicians, uh, we had a rough time over there. And the perfect example of that would would be uh, the auction in the Adrang Valley. And it never really, to the end of the war, never really got that much better. The technology improved. We had uh, multiplexers that were uh, the original kind of digital stuff, which pulse code modulation. And you could get uh, 48 voice channels, even 96 voice channels across some of those tropo systems without much of a problem uh, because all that digital stuff actually worked once they got it working. Uh, unfortunately, that was another training problem. The uh, the guys really, um, they had a course at Gordon for the operators, but the officers never really got into what, what it was. They had a separate school in Longbin, uh, which I went to, and they tried to give them a, a postcode modulation in three days or less. And that kind of worked, but training was a problem. Uh, the whole uh, disaster really was the uh, user-owned and operated problem, and that was never really fixed. And, and to this day, there's probably still that same kind of problem somewhere out there. Uh, meanwhile, back in the HF world, we were using the hell out of uh, radio teletype and man-packed HF when, when we got it to work. Uh, the, the special forces guys were were renowned for their HF because they never dropped it. They had all kinds of uh, classes on it. Their, their commo sergeants on the, on the A teams really knew what the heck they were doing, and that showed the difference in, in training. And uh, they knew the answer to George Hagen's uh, uh, PRC seventy four study before we even started because they were in the jungle doing that. All along with the regional forces and the popular forces and those A teams, those HF sets worked well. Uh, the Air Force never gave it up because of two things. Number one, there were very few satellite channels and they weren't going to any of those B 52 strikes. So, in order to find, uh, to control the B 52s, they were using uh, HF radio uh, and they had to. At the same time, uh, weather was really important. Uh, the MI guys had the responsibility for the weather and, you know, combat operations, whether it's a weapon and all that stuff, where were they getting the weather from? They were getting it from the Air Force Air Weather Service, which was very good. And how were they doing, uh, getting it down? And remember, the Army, uh, every Army division under the ROAD concept had an Air Force weather flight at the division headquarters and supposedly had weather observers, but they were Army guys at the brigade and battalion level and how, and the air force is passing down the weather forecast, HF and HF, um, facts. And you can get, remember the maps you used to see in the newspaper with the little fronts and all that stuff. They were faxing that down over HF to the air weather flights. And the air weather flights were also using the army, uh, GRC 106 as their receivers. And they had some kind of commercial fax and they were doing just fine. And so the Air Force never gave up on HF. Uh, there was HF radio in a lot of the helicopters with a like a zigzag wire antenna that Fort Monmouth designed along the tail of the UE. And that worked, but there wasn't a lot of them. The, uh, when they did the avionics, uh, they had VHF, UHF, and uh, high-band UHF, but the uh, HF was, was rare 
And they were supposed to go into command and control ships uh, along with a, about a half a dozen VRC-12s to talk to people on the ground. And if you had somebody in, that had been through the avionics course at Rucker and knew what he was doing with HF, it kind of worked, but there wasn't a lot of them. The command and control ships were very limited. And so HF in that area was very limited. But the Air Force and the soft guys really uh, used it a lot. Um when I first got involved with this stuff, if you wanted to use radio teletype, you had to have like a 10 dB signal to noise ratio on your HF set. Uh, if you had voice, and, you know, and they used to read voice lists and try to do calculations and stuff, uh, it, it had to be like 6 dB and you could kind of make out the voice. But Morse code was 3 dB and you could uh, get that through. So the soft guys never gave up on Morse code. And never gave up on HF. That part of the army was pretty good with it. Uh, the cavalry regiments also, because they had to do, um, long range, uh, reconnaissance and that kind of stuff. And you were out of VHF range. Uh, they kind of did okay with it, but, uh, the rest of the bunch, not so swell. And that led to things like the, uh, Adrang Valley stuff. Uh, trying to think the IWCS really was a success. Uh, it was partially done by the single core, but we had a lot of contractors, Ford Aerospace, uh, a couple of others in there. And they, uh, they had permanent parties in there because we couldn't train enough single guys to do it. But that backbone uh, really worked. There was some uh, early satellite stuff. There was a terminal in Fulham uh, that could go, uh, either to the Philippines where there was another terminal or someplace on the West Coast, uh, I think Traverse Air Force Base. Uh, it got used, but uh, there wasn't much channel capacity in that thing. It was really one of the first uh, satellite systems. Um, um, there was another terminal for that in Hawaii. And when time you got to Hawaii, then you could get on the cable and the bell system took over. So we had, we had ways to get in and out of the theater, but uh, some of it was a little cumbersome. The tactical level, not so much. Um, going through my notes here. I think, I think I mentioned the SRI study. They, they paid them a whole bunch of money, including combat pay, to send these guys from uh, Stanford Research. And their conclusions were pretty much the same as mine. HF worked. Uh, antennas and frequency was the key. And the training and the uh, practice and the operations had to, had to be uh, improved. And that study was done, and it kind of went back to Fort Gordon, and that was nothing. They didn't do anything. Uh, HF really, uh, at that point, uh, I think I talked about it last time, until Regency Net came along and nuclear weapons control, they were trying very hard to kill it all completely. Uh, and in order to do that, there was a thing called the Y3 radio study, sponsored and manned by Fort Gordon. And their conclusion was that we needed three new radios to make everything better that I just talked about. One was Singars, which was VHF, uh, uh, but it was slightly expanded instead of going to 76, 30 to 76 and went 30 to 88, but it hopped and it had built in encryption. And that was okay. Uh, that would take care of the VRC-12 combat net radio problems that we had. No problem there. Uh, the other thing they said they needed was MSE, mobile subscriber equipment. And I think if you're listening to me now, you probably were pretty familiar with that. That was really the first time the Army tried to build a cell phone. That was as big as a doghouse, but, well, not a doghouse, but a, a lunchbox anyway. And, but it worked. But down at the combat arms battalions, you only got like three of them for your whole battalion. Uh, the uh, echelons higher than that, there were more. And they were radio access units that were out there. And I, I think everybody that's listening knows how uh, MSC worked. Uh, that was the second one. And the third one, which is a kind of a story in itself, was a thing called EPLARS. EPLARS was originally designed as the position locating and reporting system. And if you're familiar with avionics, there's a thing called TACAN. You have a beacon on the ground, you're up in the air, and you get a range, 
and a bearing to the beacon, and you can calculate where you are. e is supposed to do the same thing, but only on the ground. And there was a, uh, a major station, and then uh, that was surveyed in by the engineers, and if you went into your station, uh, you could get the range and bearing to that station, and you would know where you were, and you could plot it on a map, and that was okay, except that you now had this base station, uh, which could easily be attacked, blown up, and disabled. So they figured out a way to make each EPLARS um, its own base station. And that was kind of okay too, but you still had to know where you were with at least one of them to get a, uh, a uh, location for you. Uh, unfortunately, um, we never fielded EPLARS, but at the same time, here comes politics. Uh, we needed a data radio and that was to take the place of radio teletype. And it was, uh, you know, it's supposed to be almost like the PRC, uh, 117s are today and what it, but set up for data. And so that goes into the, uh, the signal core planning that we need this data radio and Congress at that time. And I forget which administration it was says army, you're too expensive. No new starts. So this gets kicked around for a while and it goes back to uh signal core leadership and they say, well, uh, we, we we don't need a new start. We got this EPLARS thing that we're working on, and EPLARS will be the data radio. And that was okay, except EPLARS data throughput was about 1,200 bits per second, which was nothing compared to what we needed. So the, the Y3 radio study said, that's all we need, those three radios. And then the question came up from there, well, what about HF? There were still people using it, mostly SOF and aviation guys. And we needed a, a something to replace the GRC 106. So, uh, the Marines had a contract for the, uh, what they call the IHFR, the interim HF radio, because sooner or later we're going to have to do something about HF. And so that was the uh, PRC 104 series that we got from the Marines and all these guys in, in the uh, cavalry regiments and, uh, SOF and those kind of guys went and got those. And that was really um, to the point where they they wanted nothing really to do with it at Fort Gordon. And to prove it, they decided to study the requirement. And they put in charge of studying the requirement the Venezuelan exchange officer. And of course, now we don't even talk to the Venezuelans. But this was the guy who, who was given the job at Fort Gordon to see if we really needed an HF radio. And uh, you know how people like me reacted to that. But uh, he tried to do a good job. The first thing he did was he tried to find the IHFR specification, and nobody had a copy of it. And finally, there was at that time a thing called Signet, where all the signal officers in the world could exchange data. And I put out a call on that to see if anybody had it, and somebody did. And so we finally got him that, and then we broke off relations with Venezuela, and uh, I don't even think he ever got a chance to write a report. Uh, but HF was resurrected, like I talked about last time, uh, once we got into Afghanistan and Regency Net and stuff like that, if anybody wants to remember that. The other big HF mission in Vietnam was Mars. We had, at every post-camp and station, uh, really – fixed station stuff, we had Mars stations. And they were basically equipped by uh, with the FRAC 93 Collins KWM-2A. And they ran phone patches back into the States. They talked uh, inter-country. They were used as backup communications in case the uh, IWCS had a problem. And uh, those Collins g- deals worked uh, really, really, really well. Um And uh, they all ended up uh, getting scrapped later on. But uh, that was another big, the only HF stuff. And what happened was when the uh, radio teletype crews were uh, stood down because we know we were had used the IWCS and all that stuff, uh, they put them in the Mars stations. And uh, we were, I was net control in Longbin and we had uh, pretty good comms into Arizona believe it or not, 
to a, a ranch out there run owned by Barry Goldwater, who had about 15 local hams sitting out there doing phone patches. And Goldwater was a senator at the time, and he was paying for all the phone patches, which I thought was kind of nice. And I never got to talk to him over the radio because he was very infrequently in the station, but they had a huge station out there on his ranch with all kinds of uh, uh, rhombic antennas and uh, beams and all kinds of stuff like that. So uh, Mars was pretty valuable in those days. Nowadays, with everybody with a cell phone and all that kind of stuff and satellite phones and their I don't know if Mars is going to survive much longer, except uh, there's some people who like it, I guess. Uh, but it all boiled down to a, a lot of training problems, which Gordon didn't really want to a- address. And then uh, there was a whole bunch of people like me who kept saying, you got to do antennas and frequency somewhere. And the answer was, we're going to put it in the frequency managers course. And uh, that's going to take the place of all, all this antenna stuff. And I have never seen the curriculum there but to comment, but uh, I guess that's where it still is, uh, if anybody knows. Um, let's see. What else? I'll go. And then, uh, then the war was over. Uh, one last thing we did do before uh, the war was over for us, uh, about the, the North Vietnamese were moving down from the north to the south, heading towards Saigon, and a lot of the IWCS stations got destroyed. And so the, uh, the boys in Stratcom decided to put one of our new $15 million satellite systems, because by that time it was mid-'70s uh, at uh, – full on. And that was going to uh, take the place of all this stuff uh, that was going overseas because the uh, NVA pretty much destroyed everything else. Uh, it was there. It moved out of Monmouth, uh, went to Sacramento. Sacramento got it into Saigon. They got it into Fulham. And uh, two weeks later, they burned it because the uh, North Vietnamese were about uh, 10 miles away. So that was the end of satellite communications in Vietnam. Uh, and then things kind of got hot afterwards because everybody all of a sudden decided we got to study how we messed up, and, which I thought was a good idea. And the, the, one of the primary things they talked about was what happened in the Yadrang Valley with the 1st Cav Division and General Moore and, the, and that whole movie thing. And uh, basically they said, you know, if we had some HF radios there, we could have uh, – done something a lot different. At least we could have talked 24-7 and didn't have to walk through the uh, through the uh, airborne relay and that kind of stuff. And by the way, radio relays were used a lot, and they were very dangerous. On the ground, if you had the VHF and you couldn't quite make it, they'd look for a piece of high ground and put a VRC-49 there, which was two VRC-12s back-to-back. And they left them there and very exposed uh, usually they were not protected by anybody. So here's a bunch of single core guys, maybe from a, a combat arms battalion. They weren't single core battalion guys. And a lot of them got wiped out. Uh, and then there was the, uh, the whole touchdown thing. And that was basically kicked over to NSA. And I think, well, I wrote the paper on it, but there was a videotape uh, somewhere, which was de- later declassified. And they talked all about how all that happened. Uh, and the lack of com, com, comsec and all that kind of stuff. And I would love to see that tape again. I had a copy and I don't know where it went. <laughs> and uh, NSA did a whole long study about that. And the conclusions were cigars uh, as fast as you can. And uh, everything needs to be comsec compatible. And then after that, if you really want to get into some of the more details here, because I've only been talking for 20 minutes, um, they tasked General Rienzi, who was my brigade commander and later became uh, uh, DIS-C4, to do a study on all the aspects of things that I just talked about, which could take, you know, days and days. And you can get that online. It's called Communications Electronics, 1962 to 1970, by uh, Major General uh, Thomas Matthew Rienzi. 
and uh, he was one of the good leaders. He had picked up on on all this stuff. He was one of the backers of MSC, uh, and uh, one of the few real good signal leaders. And uh, I think at one time, no, he wasn't commander at Gordon. He went right to Fort uh, to Washington. So there were some good leadership, but the, the bottom line of what I'm saying is the signal leadership uh, really was at fault and got us into big trouble. Uh, in Vietnam, and we ended up uh, with a lot of disasters like the Adrang Valley, and we got a lot of people killed. Uh, and that is what it is. Anybody got some questions for me on that? I'd be glad to answer. Anybody still there? Hello? I'm here. It's uh, very interesting. I, I, I'm enjoying the uh, dialogue. Well, give me some questions, and uh, maybe we can get into the nitty gritties. Probably the one that, that stares at me the most is, uh, you know, you said that, <clears throat> and it's always been the case that soft were were big HF aficionados. They knew how to use it. They knew that it worked. I mean, uh, how was it that that didn't get translated to the rank and file regular use? I, I don't understand how one part of the army could be so competent in the use of the medium and the other not why uh, do you get that that's the question from the signal school if the guys went to SOF they had their own training at uh, Fort Bragg and it it was basically user owned and operated and the SOF guys brought in the right experts they hired a lot of uh, uh, civilian experts and they trained those 18 comm sergeants and uh, they they did it on their own. Uh, the, the big signal corps and the big army was trying to dump the stuff that they were using, but they had no other choice. There was no SATCOM. And uh, the PRC 74s worked. And later on, uh, they, they had um, handheld uh, message entry devices, which could uh, and that, that you had a lat rig in your hand. That PRC-74 was like 2 watts maximum, wasn't it? You were basically no, talking 20. 2 RP, were you? Or was it 20? It was 20. Oh, okay. And uh, they, they really were good at it. And they had their own uh, special forces uh, procurement guys. And uh, when, when they uh, ran out of 74s, they tried to build their own radio called the PRC-70, which was VHF and uh, HF. But... Um, they built about a thousand of them on the theory being that, uh, that we have to carry one less radio, but it ended up in the end, they'd re they decided they'd rather carry two radios because if you lost one PR 70, you lost both VHF and HF. So they weren't, you know, they, they kind of, they had them, they used them, but they re really went back to two radios. But at the same time, those guys were able to field a handheld, uh, comm device, you know, uh, uh, the OA8990 and a couple of things like that, where you could send digital messages and it had an NSA type one crypto chip in it. And they were all, um, um, encrypted. And they also had a modem that had the beginnings of some real good error detection and correction stuff. So they did even better with them. And big army didn't say much because, uh, to the big, uh, the big signal core was rat, and we wanted to get rid of rat. So were the Marines as as uh, uh, astute with HF in those days as well? Absolutely, they were. Absolutely, they? they had. Uh, they were the ones who um, who bought the original PRC 150s, but prior to that, they were using uh, um, what were they? Not 106s, but they were using uh, well, they now well, they were using other HF radios. And these guys, the Navy and Marine Corps guys, were using them like crazy. Uh, they were controlling, you know, carrier battle groups over big chunks of ocean with them. And they were uh, – uh, the, the Navy Riverine Force was using them. And their uh, training was completely different. And when you went to Navy radio school, you, it was much longer. And they taught you the system, not just the box. And they taught you a bunch of stuff about antennas and frequency assignments. The Army did none of that, or very little of it. And so the Navy and the Air Force and the soft guys 
were having great results. And uh, the Signal Corps basically was uh, trying to get out of the HF business or make it user-owned and operated. The artillery guys weren't using much HF because they, they, they had a good VHF radio, the VRC-12, and they liked that. And the range of the guns wasn't that, that much. Now with MLRS, and you got a range of the, on that missile of uh, 75 miles, you got to use HF. But uh, in the days in Vietnam, you know, the base, the, the fire bases were fairly close. And so they were getting by with, with VHF. Not much HF there, but the the avionics guys were getting were using HF, and uh, some of the armored cavalry guys. But George Hagen was out there writing his reports about how he was doing it in the jungle, and uh, talking about things like the Shirley folded dipole. If you looked at that picture, which he was making uh, at a twin leads TV twin lead, and and using those, and uh, they worked. As long as you had the right frequency, uh, frequency management was a huge problem because number one, uh, we didn't have guys who really were that good at it. And number two, you have the international agreements and believe it or not, the South Vietnamese government could, since they were the host country could override anything you wanted to do, uh, by frequency assignments. And they sometimes were a pain. Uh, but, uh, they would take all the all the really good propagating HF frequencies for themselves, and uh, I wouldn't call them great HF operators, but they they had a few people there who managed to do it. Uh, mostly trained by uh, our soft guys. That's how they managed to do it, and uh, but they they controlled the uh, the frequency assignments, believe it or not, because they were a host nation and we were part of an international treaty. So that uh, that sometimes hurt us. But uh, I don't know what more else I can say, except that uh, it was the perfect storm when we started. Uh, things have changed around quite a bit uh, due to things like Regency Net evolving into PRC uh, one, uh, one, oh, uh, 150s and stuff like that. So things are things got better later, but uh, the user-owned and operated thing is still in effect to this day, I think. And... Uh, Fort Gordon really doesn't want to wants want to do it. Rat rigs are kind of gone, but now with with the, all these uh, modern modems like the uh, serial tone modems and the parallel tone modems, uh, you can pack all that all on your back, and they do. And if you look through, I think I talked last time about the ONS process, operational need statement. Uh, these guys were getting them. They're down in the in in uh, in those uh, mine resistant vehicles and stuff like that, because the commanders have been bypassing the whole uh, system by creating an ONS and having G8 have to fund it. And the Harris guys come along with that and teach these guys in the field. And that's worked out better than anything else. So I don't know what else I can say uh, about Vietnam uh, without uh, going on and on for hours. But we had the IWCS for echelons above core, and we had the Tropo, which now you can't find Tropo in the U.S. Army anywhere. MSC had the capability at one time, and that was pushed down to the point where there was one Tropo company left, and it was in the Florida National Guard. And I don't think they're around anymore because everything now is going through the satellites, and that's okay as long as the satellite's there. Uh what they did with all that stuff that, that I had, the Track 90 uh, series of tactical tropo, I don't know. I can tell you a little side story on that, though. One day I'm sitting on Longman. I was in the radio company of the 44th Signal Battalion. And I get a call, go up the 1st Signal Brigade. Colonel Stillwell wants to see you. And I said, wait a minute. I got a battalion, a company, a battalion, and a group headquarters between me and Colonel Stillwell. Uh is this a good idea for my career? And they said, don't worry about it. Still wants to see you. He was the ops officer for the uh, first signal brigade. So I go up there and he says to me, uh, those track nineties in your motor pool, they still work. I said, sure. They still work. <laughs> he said, okay, I want you to run, uh, put, set up a track 90 system 
between here and Longbin, which was about 30 miles north and west of Saigon, and a place where I'm not going to tell you. And I said, if you don't tell me, how do I know which way to point the antenna? He says, okay, I'm going to tell you, but don't tell anybody. He gives me an azimuth. We go down to where I had my map stuff, and me and one of the warrant officers there are plotted out, and it crosses the runway at the Nam Pen Airport in, La- in uh, uh, Cambodia. And so we draw all that out, and I get the track 90s going, and we get the power to them and all that stuff. And then I go back to Colonel Stillwell, and I say, who's going to talk to me from Cambodia? And he, he says, don't ever say that again to me, <laughs> where people can hear. He says, and don't worry, somebody will be there. Start, and he gives me a date to start. So we turn everything on, and I'm looking at the receive signal on my meter, one of my meters on the receiver, and sure enough, there's a signal there. And we had the auto wire. Oh, by the way, before I forget, the auto wire for all those tactical tropo systems was a VA, it was an HF radio because tropo was going 300 miles. You couldn't do anything else. It had no satcom. So there were HF radios in all those tropo rigs. And if you knew how to use it, that was your auto wire and you could use it as an HF set. Anyway, so there's receive signal there. And I push the call button and it, the buzz goes out and somebody says, hello, can you hear me? And I said, yeah, I can. Can you hear me? He says, yeah, I can. And then they said, okay, I got one question. Who are you? And the guy says, uh, we work for Ford Aerospace. And this was two weeks before the invasion. So we had 48 channels of Tropo into uh, uh, Lon Nall and his uh, boys uh, in the Nam Pen Airport two weeks before the troops moved out and crossed the border in, in for the Cambodian invasion. And I don't know how many people actually know that to this day. But uh, it turns out I, I got to talk to them a little later on. They were uh, Air Force. NCOs who uh, got retired on some kind of fast track deal and all of a sudden were working for Ford Aerospace because there were no U.S. soldiers in Cambodia, if you recall. And uh, that was the cover. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. Also, uh, at one point, uh, same Colonel Stillwell says, those radio teletypes uh, still work? And I said, yeah. Yeah. We'll get some of those guys out of the Mars stations because when we have the invasion, one one of them's going to go with the 11th ACR and the other's going to go with the 25th Infantry Division because General um, Abrams wants to be able to talk to the lead guy in the lead squad. And the only thing we can do is use the HF radios in those rat rigs and maybe send uh, – and we had crypto in there so we can send classified information. And so – my pucker factor went up. We get the jeeps and the the uh, the, radio, the vans were uh, you know on three quarter ton trucks. We get them and then we start loading up with stuff. And my company commander shows up with a case of hand grenades and some more ammunition and sea rations and all this kind of stuff. And we sat in that motor pool, and it was we didn't know it at the time, but there was a big pissing contest going on between USV and MACV, and we belonged to USV and General. Um, the four star up there, uh, Mildred said, no, we're not sending these guys. You'll have to do it with your own guys. And we never moved out of the motor pool, <laughs> which was okay by me. But uh, that was what the plan was, was to use HF back to, to Saigon. So uh, Abrams could talk to the lead guy in the lead squad. Uh, didn't really need it, but was okay by me. I didn't want to go to Cambodia. Anyway, anything else? Well, uh, uh, David, this absolutely fantastic uh, talk this evening. I really appreciate you sharing a lot of those stories, uh, firsthand accounts. Yeah, the, well, the story is behind every story. You know, we could go on. Uh, Rienzi did kind of a good job with his communications electronics report. But uh, you remember, he was at that time a two-star general, and he had certain things that he didn't want to talk about and probably some things he didn't even know about. And he was the brigade commander. Nice guy, very competent, one of the few guys I had a lot of respect for up at, the, up at brigade headquarters. 
uh, we got hit by a, uh, a rocket one time during the rainy season and it blows this cable out of the ground that went from my microwave site down to the dial telephone exchange. So I, we find the thing and it's filling up with water and there's DC teletypes running on it. So there's sparks and everything. So I'm down in this puddle, which was about two feet deep, holding up both ends of this cable so that the teletypes don't get shorted out. And then it didn't blow it all the way through. So some of the circuits were still working. And all of a sudden behind me, there's this wave of water. And I turn around and say, don't walk so hard. <laughs> We're making waves. And it's Renzi. And he's holding up the other end of the cable. So he was a pretty good guy. You, you talked about uh, the Air Force and uh, some of their use of HF in those, those days. Was that... Um, in those days, the giant talk system, or was that? Uh, it might have been, it was before Pacer Bounce, which was another one of their systems. It might have been, it was the uh, Strategic Air Command used it, I forget the name, but it was for con- controlling B-52s. Of course, their big s- scenario. I think General that was LeMay, Giant Talk, yeah, LeMay's have, Giant Talk, yeah. Uh, LeMay uh, was was scared shitless that they, he would launch the, the bombers. They'd be out of range of you know, ground communications or something. And then he'd have to, rec- uh, he'd be ordered to recall them. And so how am I going to get to those guys when they're halfway across Europe heading for Russia? And that was his big nightmare. And a guy named Alan Christensen, who was really the Air Force's super duper HF expert, uh, had that all engineered to where uh, they could talk well by- beyond the horizon and, and all kinds of stuff. Uh to B-52s, that was one of their big uses. Their other big use was the Air Weather Service, and the and the uh, they were responsible for uh, the regional broadcasts of weather, which was kind of critical, uh, to both to the B-52s and to everybody else. And 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 their system was completely HF. They they were in Scott Air Base in uh, Illinois, was the main processing center. They had some others in theater, and they disseminated uh, weather, you know, like teletype. And also fax maps of the weather fronts and the forecasts and all that kind of stuff uh, as graphics. So they had HF uh, fax. And uh, the deal between, uh, under the National Defense Act, the deal between the Army and the Air Force was the air weather flights would be down at division and sometimes even lower levels. But the Army had to provide all the equipment and all the sustaining stuff, the food, the vehicles, and all that stuff. And that begot a program called IMETS. And uh, it had one of the first satellite receivers, but it also had uh, the P, uh, the, um, the vehicle version of the, uh, the 138, which I forget the numbers of it, but big HF radio in there to receive the weather facts and the, uh, and the broadcast and all kinds of crypto stuff. So that was a really nice HF facility. And they worked really well, but uh, right now I think they're all – um, just satellite. I think they took the HF sets out. I know they did. They took the old ones out and they put in the Harris ones, and then they took them out too. So, I guess that that's gone. But at the time in Vietnam, that was their only way to get weather down to all the aviation units, and the Army had to 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 do that for the Air Force. That was part of the. Uh, the, green, the agreement for the National Defense Act that the Army would provide everything but the personnel. And, and, and in IMETS, that was a big, big operation there, too, because the Air Weather Service uh, main computers and everything were at uh, Scott Air Force Base. But the whole key there was the software, uh, along with the communications links. And the big question became, uh, are we going to rewrite this software to run on Army boxes? And the boss at that time was a really smart general, Bill Harmon. And he said, let's see if we can get the Air Force software to run on Army common hardware computers. And they did. <laughs> and it saved a whole bunch of money. So uh, the Air Weather guys were pretty happy uh, with all that stuff. And, and, and But I think all their HF stuff is gone now at IMETS. I think they just took it out. That was at the time, though. That was a big use, and we had B fifty two strikes going on in Vietnam, 
So uh, that's how they were commanding and controlling them because they didn't come from uh, in theater. They came from like islands in the Pacific and uh, it was like a 12, 14 hour flight, drop your bombs and fly back. I think they came from Guam or someplace and uh, HF controlled them all the way, both ways. That's all they had, but it worked. And uh, we did have HF in, in the UEs uh, and a zigzag antenna that ran up the tail boom, which was later replaced by a loop that we developed at Fort Monmouth in the uh, avionics lab, which worked better. So that was the story for HF. The rest of it was really a training and, and politics story and, and leadership story. And I'm really down on the signal leadership in those days. Because uh, this whole user owned and operated, and officers will learn OJT came from them. Now, what were their motivations, constraints? Probably money for one. But we we were taking officers, commissioning officers in the Signal Corps. There was one guy in my SOPC class had a degree in therapeutic massage, the bachelor's degree, and he had a Signal commission. <laughs> And and basically, and there were others like him, and he got sent to a mech battalion in uh, in Germany because he had a three year commitment for some reason, and he was there for about eighteen months, and then they sent him to Vietnam, and I don't, I ran into him as he was coming in and I was going out, and uh, I didn't have much confidence in the guy, and I sure know they didn't have any training, and that was common. O two hundred basic signal officer. So where they came up with the concept, who pushed it, I don't know. I, I just had to see it when I was there. Uh, when I was in SOPC, we had to fill out a uh, course critique. So, you know me, I uh, didn't give them a real good critique, and we we're about to leave. We had had the final formal dinner and all that stuff, and the guy shows up and he says, Colonel Ring, the commandant, wants to talk to you. Okay, so I go over there. And he's got my critique. He says, I see you weren't real happy with the uh, quality of instruction at, at OBC. And I said, you're right. Then we talked about a few things. And I said, you know, you had nine weeks. The first two weeks were things like how to salute and how to put your uniform on and stuff you should have learned in ROTC or uh, West Point or somewhere. And uh, really didn't get into much stuff. And, and I said, now here, and I pulled out some stuff that I had, and I said, here was the final exam on the radio portion of the course. And it basically said things like, the nomenclature of the GRC-106 transmitter is T-A-B-C, T-123, things like that. I said, that's why they write manuals and put nameplates on, on, on hardware. <laughs> why don't you ask questions like to tell if you really know anything about radios? And, well, you have to understand that we... We get people from all over with all kinds of backgrounds, uh, some of them not as good as yours. And so we have to shoot for the middle, you know, the center of mass of the class. And uh, so uh, so between that and the OJT, uh, that's how we're going to deploy them. Uh, and, and to me, it was a total disaster. But I, I know we got people killed because of it. The Edrang Valley thing was was a perfect example. If those guys, finally, two days after the, the fight started, somebody put up an RC-292 and they could talk direct to the fire base and back to the brigade, who was their supporting people. For two days, uh, if the helicopter was up there and Major Crandall could re repeat the message over his over his uh, ARC-51 or whatever he had up there, uh, that was fine. But the helicopter ran out of gas or the weather moved in, or the sun went down. And then they were on their own. Sad, sad but true. Plus no comsec. The bad guys were reading the mail like crazy. And that you can look up on Operation Touchdown or Project Touchdown. And NSA did a whole study on that. And uh, if you can find the tape, and I, someday we're in New Jersey and my old attic is probably a copy of it. Uh, they had pictures and all kinds of stuff. 
and they had it first it was classified then it was declassified then they reclassified it and the last time i saw it it was unclassified again but it was pretty heavy into what they were doing and how they were doing it and lots of intercepts of u.s voice conversations unencrypted giving away all kinds of information and and you could read the bad guy's logs and he's writing down verbatim in english what was being said and then in the margin he was translating as to what it meant that's how good they were and and when they uh for years, there were people that in ASA at the time, Army Security Agency, was telling the, uh, these people that that was happening. And first CAV had the real disaster. That was the Ed Drang thing. And the first CAV commander, whose name I can't remember right now, Kennard, who became a big wheel in the Army after that, uh, says, our movements are too rapid and too immediate for them to do anything with any information in it that they glean from our radio nets. Because I say so. <laughs> and meanwhile, these guys were reading the mail all the time. And I know that was going on in Afghanistan and, and, and uh, because those guys didn't have enough radio, so they went out and bought to the PX and they bought uh, FRS ski radios. And nobody stopped them. So what can I say? Any more questions? I guess not. Matt, you still there? I am, Dave. I am, and I really appreciate it. Uh, looks like Kyle got kicked back out, but he's back in. Um, and, and we definitely appreciate you taking this time. Uh, that, that's a good uh, solid solid hour plus of just amazing stories. And, and I know uh, this it's will resonate well amongst all of us and again i really appreciate you taking this time you're always invited back to talk to about more stories in the future uh, you're always welcome here uh, to to the club named after you and, and did they actually that approve that yeah they sure they, 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 they the paperwork's there and we said anything so we, we got <laughs> it we got it and that's all that matters so hey, it's been, i'd love to have a picture of that to show to a few people <laughs> a picture on on the building yeah, we're we're just gonna find a building, just throw your name up on that thing. And, oh, okay, that was my question. Did you get a building? No, nah, not yet. Every still, every still. Uh, if you ever do, I need a picture of that with the building number and a, and a wide shot of the building. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The first person who gets that. There's certain people in the single core that would get a real hoot out of that. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much. Appreciate okay, if anything it. else comes up, let me know. I'll yeah, be glad to sit in. Uh, if you send me the link, I'll be glad to sit in any time. But uh, it really, uh, every story I told has got more stories behind it. And there are names, too, behind the stories. You know, but most of them are probably gone by now. But uh, it, it wasn't pretty. I sure enjoy your time here today, and I definitely hope you'll come back. I, I'm sure I'll have a million questions to bring up uh as as we uh, uh, have you come back again, thanks again for coming. Yeah, it was it was kind of the perfect storm. We had all of that stuff. Uh, with, I'm still mad at the Harvard Business School, but you know, what can you do? It's over. But I hope we learned some lessons out of it. You tell me. You're at Gordon. I don't know, but uh, I hope they learned something from it. Anyway, I guess I'm uh, out here. You okay. Have an amazing night, you too, David. You have an amazing night, and thank you so much for taking this time to talk to us. My pleasure. And if anybody wants any more details for whatever, let me know, and I'll be glad to give them to you. Awesome. Okay. Everybody, okay. have a good night.